When we think of Jesus, we think of headlines. Born of a virgin, did crazy miracles, and rose from the dead. But who was Jesus outside of holiday-worthy events? Who was Jesus in between? Well, today we're, we're continuing in this series, uh, Jesus in Between. Uh, we've been looking at Jesus between Christmas and Easter. Because if all we know about Jesus is holiday Jesus, then we're missing a huge part of the story. We're missing who he is and, and what he's like and what were his priorities, what was his passion, how did he interact with different people, how did he respond in different situations. And as I think about this, I was thinking about what if the only thing we knew about Abraham Lincoln was his birth and his death? We would know that he was born in a humble cabin in in Illinois and 56 56 years later that he was assassinated as president. That's leaving a lot out of the story, right? Well, we need to know and understand who Jesus is Jesus is between his birth and his resurrection. So we've been looking at the stories from the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Uh, This morning we're gonna spend the bulk of our time in Mark chapter 10. Um, So far we've learned that Jesus is fully man and fully God. He empathizes with us. He has authority over all things. He has the authority and the ability to meet my most pressing needs. He shows compassion to the sinner. He deserves our worship. Well, this week we want to talk about what Jesus talks to us about greatness. Have you ever, have you ever been surrounded by greatness? I, I was thinking about this and when uh, my brother and I, uh, many years ago, we were down at the mall in North Canton during Hall of Fame football week. And we didn't know this, but on that particular night, both football teams that were going to be playing in the Football Hall of Fame were at the mall. The shoe stores were filled. (laughs) And so you would pass a shoe store and it's like, man, these guys are huge. These guys are big. I mean, it's one thing watching them on TV, it's another to stand next to an NFL professional football player. But we felt so small, so insignificant. We felt like we were in the middle of greatness. And that may be one kind of greatness, but the definition of greatness can be a little wiggly. In our world today, greatness is measured in so many different ways. It's pretty subjective. I mean, I remember the first time I heard someone called the goat. And I thought, man, that's, that's rough. That's not very nice, calling him the goat. I mean, I don't want to be called the goat. And then I realized it meant greatest of all time. And I thought, well, that's a lot different. So I thought this morning, I want to be a little interactive. I want you to help me to figure some things out. So I'm going to give you some choices, and you let me know by, by applauding or cheering who you think or what is the goat. So we'll start off simple here. Uh, Chick-fil-A or Chipotle? All right, Chick-fil-A. All right, Chipotle. Oh, wow, yeah, definitely. Greatest basketball player, Michael Jordan or LeBron James? All right, Michael Jordan. (laughs) LeBron James. All right. Greatest band, the Beatles, or you too? Ah, I hear groans. <laughs> the Beatles. You too. Oh, wow. I like you. <laughs> All right, sci fi people. Greatest sci fi genre Star Wars or Star Trek? All right, Star Wars? <laughs> Star Trek. <laughs> wow. All right, last one. Greatest looking pastor. <laughs> pastor Bob or Pastor Bob? And so we could. <laughs> yeah, there, there's no one to compare him to, right? 
Well, as you can see, there's a lot of different opinions on these different, on what is the GOAT. Even with all the stats and accumulated championships and box office and sales figures, the greatest of all time is almost always a debatable question. Everyone has their own opinion. Who's the greatest? What's the greatest? How do we measure greatness? Do we measure it by stats? Do we measure it by by championships? No one agrees on the GOAT. Greatness is sometimes hard to measure. Jesus, however, gives a pretty clear definition and and description of what it means to be great. So to get a little context around the passage we're looking at today, the event that we're looking at in Mark chapter 10 also is recorded for us in Matthew chapter 20. And it occurs at the end of Jesus' ministry. In fact, it takes place about a week before the cross as Jesus and his disciples are, are walking toward Jerusalem. And so these are the final action-packed days as the clock ticks down to the cross. And while Jesus is coming to grips with the, the painful reality of the death that looms before him, his top men, his disciples, are angry, angling for better seats in the kingdom. The problem is Jesus had already told them, in fact, three different times each time with greater detail of what was going to happen when they got to Jerusalem. In fact, in this chapter, Mark chapter 10, he says, we're going up to Jerusalem and the son of man will be be delivered to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles who will mock him and spit on him, flog him and kill him. Three days later, he will rise. Well, you would think that hearing a statement like that, there would be a a ton of questions, like, what do you mean, Jesus? And there might be a, a greater response to what Jesus has said. But we realize even from earlier when he talked about the same time, same thing, the second time Jesus mentions it back in Mark chapter nine, it says, but they, the disciples, didn't understand what he meant. They were afraid to ask him about it but they kept quiet because on the way they had argued about who was the greatest. Now the text doesn't say why they were afraid to ask him about it, but I think that, that Jesus, what Jesus said didn't fit their understanding and expectations, so they chose to ignore it. Truth is they were more worried about their own things and, and what was going to happen to, with them than they were concerned about what would happen to Jesus. And so this time after Jesus mentions his death and resurrection, we read this in verse 35. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. Well, James and John were part of this inner circle. James, John, and Peter had had some unique moments with Jesus that the others hadn't experienced. Most most significantly, they were the ones who witnessed Jesus' transfiguration. They had went up on a mountaintop to pray with Jesus, and Jesus reveals himself to them in his glory. You see, the inner circle of disciples had, had only known him in his human body, but now they had a greater realization that Jesus was God in the flesh. They couldn't fully understand that. They couldn't fully comprehend it. But it gave them reassurance about the things that Jesus had said were about to happen. And so now they come to Jesus with this interesting question. They they approach Jesus and ask him to do whatever they ask him to do. (laughs) Well, it's interesting because Matthew tells it a little bit differently. Instead of James and John asking the question, Matthew writes, their mom approaches Jesus. That's weird, (laughs) maybe a little embarrassing, but their mom approaches Jesus with this question. What's interesting is that their mom was Salome, who was the sister of Jesus' mother, Mary. She's Jesus' aunt. And so was she trying to leverage her relationship to Jesus' mom for her boys? Well, whether the request came directly from the boys or from mom, either way, it seems presumptuous. It seems bold, maybe even a little immature. Like, when a, have you ever had a child come to you and say, I have a question and you can't say no? 
Or they say it like this, promise to say yes when I ask. (laughs) Parenting tip, (laughs) never agree to that. (laughs) Jesus responds this way, what do you want me to do for you, he asks. They replied, let us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. And Jesus said, you don't know what you're asking. You see, they want positions of power and proximity to Jesus. They're asking Jesus to recognize them and and give them positions of greatness because they assumed that Jesus was going to walk into Jerusalem and and take over the Romans and set up a new kingdom and and they wanna be a part of it. They wanna be right there with Jesus. They wanna be a significant part of his rule. And it was a small way of looking at greatness. They saw greatness as a position, as, as a seat to hold, as something to do. But the problem was they didn't realize the price of the seats. They approach Jesus, give us your right and your left. We've followed you. We, we deserve special treatment. And Jesus responds, you, you have no idea what you're asking. And he continues in verse 38, can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? In other words, do you know what these seats cost? Are you sure you can afford it? You see, the cup that Jesus was going to drink was filled with suffering and death. His baptism was going to be an immersion into great suffering. And so their their response is a little surprising, I think, without thinking or maybe pride. They respond, we can. We can do it. And Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup I drink. You will be baptized with the baptism that I'm baptized with but to sit at my right or my left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they've been prepared. And so Jesus says basically, yep, you're right. You will suffer on behalf of me. And that's exactly what happened. James will be the first disciple martyred, stoned to death. John will be exiled on an island after tradition tells us they they tried to boil him alive in, in oil and he didn't die. And so they do drink the cup at some level. Then Jesus informs them that he's not in charge of seating arrangements in the kingdom. He's he's the host, but the Father will handle the seating chart. And when, he, when the, trend, the other disciples, the 10, heard about this, they became indignant. Of, they were angry with James and John. They weren't upset that James and John had asked. They're upset that they hadn't asked before them. And I think if any one of us were there, we had been upset too. Because they had ditched the rest of the disciples in order to get to the top. They weren't concerned for anyone but themselves. And in the process appears they also left Jesus behind. Jesus in his most vulnerable state of describing the suffering and death that was to come. They totally ignore him in order to press their case for greatness. Now I think about this, it's it's a little sobering to think that I can often, that we can often do the same things. In our desire to provide for our family and maybe give them what we never had, we can completely neglect our time and relationship with them. In our desire to make an impact in our community, we can fail to develop friendships with our next door neighbors. In our desire to to sweeten our resume a little bit, we disregard the influence we have on those around us right now. In our pursuit to be great in the moment, we destroy potential longevity of our relationships and influence. And so I love Jesus' response. He he doesn't condemn them. He he uses their arguing as, as a teachable moment because Jesus is about to teach his disciples something that would fly in the face of everything they understood about greatness. And so Jesus calls a huddle. Come on, guys, gather around. Gather around, huddle up. And it says that Jesus called them together and said, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. 
and their high officials exercise authority over them. And so the disciples were all too familiar with the Gentile model of authority. They used authority and power and domination to rule over others. They had a pecking order and the Jewish people were at the bottom. Their history was filled with cruel kings and brutal leaders who showed little regard for the Jewish people. But Jesus, he says, you know the Gentiles and how they rule and and they have authority over and they have this pecking order. Jesus flips the definition and says, not so with you. Not so with you. He's saying, you know how this world works. More power, more prestige, more ambition, more money will get you more things. Leadership is about control and influence through power, throwing your weight around. Not so with you. I feel like it's such a, a so much stronger statement than we give it attention. It's easy to, to read right through this that, oh, Jesus is giving an alternative or, or he's making a suggestion on how he would prefer us to live. But I think his statement is a lot deeper. It's a lot more cutting edge than that. Because this isn't just another alternative for us to consider. No, this is a radical changeover. And Jesus is saying, you want to be a part of Jesus' plan, of my plan? Serve. You want to be a significant player in, in my kingdom? Serve. You want to be a part of a movement? Serve. You want to make the most of life? Serve. You want to live to make Jesus make sense? Serve. You want to experience God's purpose and and plan for your life to the full. Serve. You want to live for something greater than yourself? Jesus says, serve, be a servant. More than that, take the mindset and lifestyle of a slave. See, Jesus isn't telling them they need to just simply modify their behavior a little bit. He's asking them to rearrange their entire lives around here, to follow his example. Not so with you is referring to a a fundamental change in the way we live, in the way we think, in the way we prioritize. And if you're a follower of Jesus, you're primarily and foremost a citizen of heaven. And Jesus is saying, you've got to have a bigger, longer, more eternal perspective. One that's more fitting for someone who's part of God's kingdom, not this world. You see, it doesn't make sense in our world. But we're living for something greater and longer and and more outlasting than the gains of this life and this world. We can't live the way Jesus wants us to live if we're living just for for little religious moments here and there. And we're not living a part of his radical movement of kingdom values that change the way we think, that change the way we make decisions, that change the way we think about our lives. You see, there's more at stake than than we can imagine. Jesus is redefining greatness. And so our first point this morning, Jesus defines greatness by who we are, not what we do. As a far of Jesus, this life has less to do, has less to do with positions and titles. Rather, it's an attitude that says people and relationships are more important, are more valuable and essential to Jesus' mission and purpose. Hebrews chapter 11 is often called the, the chapter, the faith chapter. It, it lists men and women who gave, who suffered, who sacrificed, who lived in obedience to God through faith. And they did it because they had a longer, bigger, greater perspective of reality. They weren't living for press releases, looking to put together a a hype reel of accomplishments. No, these men and women were living out a life with a longer, broader, greater, deeper perspective. I love these verses that talk about Moses' decision to live for something greater than himself. It says, by faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. 
He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. You see, Moses chose to serve rather than be served. He chose God's way instead of his own way. He chose the we over the me. He chose the long view with the mindset of a servant. This is the path that Jesus himself demonstrates. He had a long view, an eternal perspective that that outweighed the suffering of the cross. He demonstrated it back in week two during the temptation. Satan approaches him and says, ah, Jesus, you can take care of your hunger right now. Turn Turn that stone in the bread. Take care of yourself. Put yourself first. And then he says, you don't have to go to the cross. Look, you can have all these kingdoms. You can rule now. You can have all this power. But Jesus didn't fall for it. Hebrews tells us that because of the joy awaiting Jesus, because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and now is seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. You see, it's ingrained in us. It's ingrained in us. It's about me. It's it's all about what I want. It's what others will do for me. It's about my rights and my privileges. And Jesus says, no, not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. Do you want to be great? Jesus says, serve. Do you want to be first? Jesus says, be a slave to all because their greatness is determined by how well you love and serve and encourage and walk with others and put the interest of others above your own. To be a servant is the word diakonos, which refers to a a table waiter. And he says, don't be a person that, that everybody serves, be the person who serves everybody. That's a big difference. Be the server, be the served. Be the table waiter. That's what it is to be a servant, but it doesn't end there because Jesus takes it a step further in saying, be the slave of all. Now, slavery was different than we understand today, but the basics were the same. Slaves were inferior to servants. Servants did a job. Slaves were owned and controlled by a master. So not only do we have an opportunity to serve, we have an obligation to serve. It's a mindset, a way of looking at life, a way that we live. Jesus lived his life this way. He had the mindset of a servant, and Jesus is saying, greatness is driven by who you are. So what does an identity built on servanthood look like? What does an identity built on the mindset of a servant, of a slave, look like? Well, I love C.S. Lewis. He's He's a theologian and author. He writes just this great part about what it means to be humble, what it means to serve. He says, if we were to meet a truly humble person, we would never come away from meeting thinking that they were humble. They would not always be telling us that they were a nobody because a person who keeps saying they're a nobody is actually a self-obsessed person. The thing that we would remember from meeting a truly gospel humble person is how much they seem to be totally interested in us. Because the essence of gospel humility is not thinking more of myself or even thinking less of myself. It is thinking of myself less. Gospel humility is not needing to think about myself, not needing to connect things with myself. And so you see, when we understand our identity in Jesus Christ, we start striving from greatness, not for greatness. All of Jesus' teaching assumes that true humility is based on a healthy understanding of our identity in Jesus Christ, convinced of our identity as children of God, and the security and love that that brings, we're, we're, <clears throat> we're better able to serve without being offended or frustrated by the lack of recognition or the difficulty that serving brings. 
And see, to determine if you have a healthy mindset about serving, there's some good questions we can ask ourselves, such as, how do you respond when no one acknowledges what you did? How do you react when others take your service for granted? How do you feel when someone criticizes something you did for them? What if the service you're being asked to do is something inconvenient or unpleasant? You see, when I ask myself these questions, the response, to my, the response to these questions reveals a lot about me. It starts to reveal my attitude and, and the mindset of servanthood and the security and confidence that we have as children of God. You see, Jesus is both our example and our motivation. Jesus wasn't focusing on keeping his position and getting more. He was focused on giving it away. And so Jesus defines greatness by who we are, not what we do. And as we've already, already touched on, he also defines greatness as serving, not being served. And really, this brings us to the heart of the gospel. It brings us to the heart of the gospel because the last thing that Jesus, is, Jesus says in verse 45, it says, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. I want us to read that in color this morning. Consider who Jesus is. He's the creator and sustainer of all things. Think of the expanse of the universe. Earth is is a pretty minute part of it. And then as you roll out in the solar system and the galaxy and, and the universe, Earth gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And so we're only a speck on a speck among a billion of other specks. The universe is huge and the Bible tells us that Jesus is the creator and sustainer of the entire thing. All that power, all that might. And he willingly takes on flesh. Is born a baby in a humble manger. He lives among us and loving us and serving and giving his life for us. That's what Paul marvels over in Philippians chapter two as he encourages us to serve and to love like Jesus. He says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And I think everybody loves that last part. But we can't forget the context which is he got there by humbling himself by being a servant and going to the cross. You see, at the name name of Jesus, everyone's gonna bow. Everyone's gonna confess that Jesus is Lord. Why? Because in love, he took on the flesh of his creation. In obedience, he went to the cross. We can't forget that. And so the the gospel drives why we're to serve. Jesus gave his life as a ransom, as a payment for our sins. He served us to the point of giving up everything, even his life, for us. I think it's safe to say that we can't understand true greatness till we understand Jesus and watch how he demonstrates it. You see, it's a lot easier to talk about all these things than to actually put it into action and to live it. And honestly, talks like these can really mess me up. It can really mess us up because all of a sudden we start to ask the right questions and we begin to realize just how self-absorbed our lives have become. 
In fact, I feel like a lot of our interpersonal relationship problems, our, our issues at work, our difficulties in marriage and family, our, dis, our discontentment is rooted in this serve me attitude. When life becomes all about me and my needs and my wants and my rights, the health of my qual- and quality of my life just shrinks away. And so it's kind of ironic that the more we focus on ourselves, the more discontent and frustrated we're going to be. The more we give our lives away by serving others, the more we live with a long view, understanding our identity and being secure in our identity and the value in Jesus Christ, the greater our sense of purpose and mission will be. Why? Because Jesus defines greatness as a focus on others, not ourselves. A focus on others. You see, I think one of the hardest parts of being a servant and having the servant mindset is is just opening our eyes. We can become so preoccupied with our own problems and our own lives and our own needs and and our own wants and all about us, we don't see the people around us. And Jesus shows us another way because Jesus is walking closer to the cross now every day. Every day brings him closer to the suffering and rejection that he's going to experience through his trial and and crucifixion. And yet he's still others focused. You see, right after his teachable moment with his disciples and the huddle breaks, Jesus leads by example by demonstrating what it means. I think it's fascinating both Matthew and Mark follow up this discussion about greatness with with the disciples with Jesus healing a blind beggar. You see, Jesus demonstrates service not only at the cross, but he demonstrated it every day of his life because beggars were considered outcasts. Stay away from them. Mark chapter 10 verse 46 refers to this blind beggar as Bartimaeus. In other words, the son of Timaeus, which literally means son of impurity. It makes you wonder what his family tree was like. But few religious people would have anything to do with a beggar. In fact, the man is, is, is Jesus and his disciples and the crowds are, are filing by. This man is, is crying out to Jesus and the crowd basically tells him, hey, just be quiet, shut up, shh. It's not about you. But Jesus stops. (laughs) Jesus stops and asks him a question and talks to him and listens and he heals him. I'm sure Jesus had a lot of other things on his mind. But he takes the time to pay attention to and to serve a man everyone else had forgotten or dismissed that was invisible to most of the crowd. I see one pastor writes, I I love this because it's so true of Jesus and so challenging to us. He writes, the cost of true greatness is humble, selfless, sacrificial service. The Christian who desires to be great and first in the kingdom is the one who is willing to serve in the hard place, the uncomfortable place, the lonely place, the demanding place, the place where he's not appreciated and may even be persecuted. Knowing that time is short and eternity long, his is willing to spend and be spent. He's willing to work for excellence without becoming proud, to withstand criticism without becoming bitter, to be misjudged without becoming defensive, and to withstand suffering without succumbing to self-pity. Wow, that's a description of Jesus. I wonder if this could be a description of us. This past winter, I had to take a, a trip to, to California. I had some meetings out there, and it's just a real short trip and a short weekend, so I took the red eye on the way back home. In fact, by the time we got on the plane and actually left, it was like 1 a.m. I was thinking, man, this is gonna be a long flight. I'm gonna be tired. And so beforehand, it's one of those airlines where uh, you pay for everything, <laughs> Like there's no free peanuts, no free pretzels, there's no free cups of water or drinks or uh, ginger ale and Coke and things like that. There's nothing free. And so I splurged a little and I thought, you know, 
I want to be able to sleep the five hours on this flight. And so I splurged for the big seat. <laughs> you know, I got the big seat and I got a window seat so I could kind of lay up against it. And I, my plan was to sleep all five hours on this plane. And I settled in my seat, got comfortable, figure out, okay, this is, this is perfect. And this young couple comes on the plane with a baby. <laughs> And they're sitting in the row ahead of me and the row behind me. You see their seats had been, they were separated. And so that was a problem. It's like, how are we going to take care of this baby this entire flight with just you back there and me here and this and that? So the stewardess talks to the guy in front of me. And she said, would you mind switching seats with this couple so that they can sit together? He's like, no, I paid for this seat. This is the seat I want. She looks at me. (laughs) Can I just be honest? (laughs) I had purposely chosen my seat for maximum sleep potential. (laughs) I had it all planned out. So I have this little debate going on in my mind. Do I give up my prime sleeping seat for a seat on the aisle and no place to put my head? And so I had this list of reasons in my mind why I should just stay right where I was. Well, didn't they pick their seats? And I paid for my seat and I chose mine way ahead of time. Why didn't they? And and this and that. And I had this whole list. Can Can we be clear? There's always a list of reasons not to serve. (laughs) You know, sometimes they may be legitimate. (laughs) But I... I wasn't going to separate that family, so I moved. And the steward and the stewardess and the family were so appreciative, the result, they gave me a voucher for a free 500 miles. Nope. The stewardess approached me and said, hey, would you like a can of ginger ale for for being so (laughs) servant-like? Nope. (laughs) And God gave me the best five hours of sleep that one could possibly get on a plane. Nope. (laughs) What I received was a very restless, uncomfortable flight and a sermon illustration. (laughs) You see, I don't always do the right thing. I don't always do the Jesus thing, the unselfish thing. But I knew I did the right thing this time. But you know what? It didn't work to my advantage. <laughs> but I like, <laughs> I like what Mother Teresa once said. She said, a life not lived for others is not a life. And then she said this. People are unrealistic, illogical, and self-centered. Love them anyway. People are often unreasonable and self-seeking. Forgive them anyway. If you are kind, people may accuse you of ulterior motives. Be kind anyway. If you're honest, people may cheat you. Be honest anyway. If you find happiness, people may be jealous. Be happy anyway. The good you do today may be forgotten tomorrow. Do good anyway. Give the world the best you have, and it may never be enough. Give your best anyway. For you see, in the end, it's between you and God. It was never between you and them anyway. (laughs) And that's what Jesus did for us. He loved us anyway, all the way to the cross. Yeah, there may be times when you have to say no. In fact, there's times when the wisest thing is to say no. However, if your no's to others are consistently greater than your yeses for yourself, maybe it's time to take a hard look at the kind of life that Jesus has called us to. Truth is, if you decide to live the great life, the life of a servant, you're going to find yourself inconvenienced at times, walking further in the rain because you gave up the closest parking spot to someone else. You'll find yourself washing the dishes when you'd rather be watching the game. 
You'll find yourself playing catch or or kicking a ball in the backyard with your son or daughter, even though you've had an exhausting day at work. Your peace and quiet may be disrupted to spend time listening to to a neighbor who's lonely. Your day off may be used to cook a meal for a friend who's unable to cook for themselves. It won't be easy. It won't always be convenient, but it could be great. You see, the role of the servant starts at home. It starts in our marriages and our families. It rolls out from there. The role of servant requires us to continually ask ourselves questions. When faced with James and John's mixed up motives, Jesus asked them, well, what do you want me to do for you? You see, even in this, he put himself in a position to serve. And so what if throughout our day, we were asked the same thing? How can I help? How can I help in this situation? What what can I do to assist you? What needs done here? Are we looking for opportunities to serve and to love others? And maybe we need to ask more often, how can I help? And then sort through our motives. And we may need to ask ourselves, well, what is it I want? In other words, what what is it I want from this? Why am I doing this? Why am I I really serving? Is there someone I'm trying to, to impress? On whom am I shining the spotlight in my life? What's my motive? You see, we have the motivation and the power to serve because we've been perfectly loved and served, sacrificially served by our Savior, Jesus. And the more we understand his mission for us, the more we'll understand our mission to serve. And so I just want to encourage you, I want to challenge you this morning, would you be willing this week to start off every day by asking these questions and praying? And throughout your day, asking the question, how can I help? How can I be a service? How can I come along and assist? And then pray, Lord, help me to see where I can help today. Help me open my eyes to the opportunities that are all around me. And then, what is it I want? And pray, Lord, help me to shine the light bright on you. Imagine. Imagine if we were to start living with the minds of a, of a servant asking, how can I help instead of how can I be helped? Imagine what it would mean for our spouses, our kids, our families, our friends, our coworkers, our neighbors, if we were to adopt the mindset of Jesus, the role of a servant. Could be great. Let's pray. Father, Thank you for not only talking to us about these things, but demonstrating it through Jesus. Lord, thank you that you sent Jesus who left the glories of heaven to live in our mess, to take on our flesh, to live life among us, to give his life, to give his life, taking our sin upon himself so that he could be the perfect sacrifice so that we might be clothed, that we might be covered in his righteousness and be called children of God. Father, thank you. Thank you that Jesus humbled himself for us in that way. Father, I pray that our response would be to serve as we've been sacrificially served. And we would learn to love as you have lavished love on us, even when we didn't deserve it. And Father, that we would forgive in the way that you've forgiven us. Father, help us to live with this gospel mentality, motivated out of who you are and what you've done for us, that we might live to make Jesus make sense in this crazy world. Father, help us to serve. Open our eyes to the situations around us. 
And then Father, help us to expose our own motives. Am I shining the spotlight on me or is the spotlight on Jesus? Father, I thank you. Thank you for this passage and how it encourages us today. Lord, we love you too. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.